first off, guys, thanks for sticking uh, sticking around. I know there's see some tired faces, long days for for all of you having to get through uh, to get through two two long days to get through five rounds. But appreciate your your guys staying up. You know, I think from a from a New York Mets standpoint, what we what we focused on and prioritized tonight, similar to what we did last year, is high end impact talent in any draft. People want to try to acquire major league players that can impact their club either now or in the future. And you hope to get the best player you can at a a particular spot. This year, we had the opportunity, again, to be very aggressive in targeting players that, you know, frankly, sat among the top players on our overall draft board. You know, to be in a position at the front of the draft where we have uh, Pete Crow Armstrong and JT, JT Ginn and Isaiah Green as our first three picks, I don't think we, uh, we could have possibly imagined that, that that type of talent could, could be coming into the organization with a, with a five-round draft. The fact that we're able to add three more players into the mix as well makes us feel like this is, this is a draft that will impact and, and really continue to change the face of our, of our player development system. So I'm happy to answer questions, but I just want to acknowledge you know, Omar, Minaya and, Omar Minaya and his leadership throughout this, uh, this draft process. Tommy and Tram continue to lead a tremendous group of cross checkers and area scouts that put us in a position to, to identify and draft the best talent in, in the game. And you know, now we gotta go to work, we gotta try to sign these guys and make sure that this, this effort and this risk can, can result in a reward for, for not only the organization, but most importantly, the Mets fans. Hey guys, this is for really any of you. Um, I have two questions regarding Ginn. One is broadly, what do you like about him and where is he just in terms of his rehab process? And then secondly, you mentioned this is similar to last year. And last year, you were pretty adamant on draft night um, when you drafted Matt Allen that, you know, this was a guy that you had researched, you knew you were going to sign. Do you feel as strongly about Ginn that he is signable for you? Uh, I'll let Tommy or Tram, you guys can talk about uh, JT is a is a talent and what we like like about him, and then I'm happy to answer the uh, the signability aspect. Okay. Well, we we we've liked Ginn for years now. Uh, we really have. We had strong interest uh, in him in high school. He got picked in front of us. Uh, this is uh, a rare combination of turbo sync, as we call it, uh, with strikeout ability. He, he's anywhere from 91 to 99. It's an out-pitch curveball, an at-will curveball that he throws for strikes. It's a plus changeup. It's a super athletic kid. In high school, I think he hit 26, 27 home runs. Uh, go, goes to Mississippi State and dominates his freshman year. Uh, he's got all the qualities of being a top-of-the-rotation guy. Yeah, we, I'll piggyback on that with from Tommy. This was a player that we, we loved in high school. Again, Tommy talked about the power sinker with the power breaking ball and the ability to get ground balls and strikeouts, which is a little bit rare. Um, He pitches with a mean streak. He's an athlete. You know, everything, you look on our major league staff, we've got power pitchers. This fits right in that mold. And uh, we're very excited to get him. Tony, the second part of your question, you know, I think what Tommy said is worth worth noting. There's, There's history with this player. There's... There's long, I guess we're going back now, two or three years of work that's been done on him. So that helps. That's a, that's a starting point. Secondly, we recognize that he's a premium talent, and premium talent's going to require real investment in terms of dollars. So you know, our, our hope and, and our belief is that his talent and his, his expectation for the value of his talent will match up to, to our interest in, in rewarding him for that talent with, with a premium premium signing bonus, but that's, that's work to be done. But, but it is a, a recognition when talent and evaluation match up, then we have the, the hope that we'll be able to bring a player like this into the organization. And, and just regarding his injury, his surgery, you know, where is he at? Did, did that give you any pause or was that even more a, a reason thinking maybe he could be more signable for you? Well, we, we've had a lot of success, as, as most of you know, with our, our major league rotation, uh, both in terms of who we have now and you know, even some of the players that we that we used to be used to have in the organization, like Zach Wheeler and Matt Harvey, we've got a long and good track record of rehabbing players in, from Tommy John surgery and developing them into major league major league stars. We we think that we have the infrastructure to help JT in his rehab. He clearly is fresh 
from his surgery date. You know, he, he, he's not that far removed from surgery. The, uh, the surgeon, Dr. Elitraj, and our doctor have a, a good understanding of you know, the, the procedure that they do. We review the medical files, and by all accounts, surgery went incredibly well. He's on his road to a good start of rehab, and we'll be uh, coordinating with him to make sure that, that the work that he started will continue, and, and hopefully we can enhance it. Hey, it's Tim Britton from The Athletic. Uh, I think the, the impulse for a lot of us, I guess this question is for Brody, the, the impulse for a lot of us is to compare this to the Matthew Allen situation last year. But I'm wondering how different uh, is the, the negotiating leverage first with a, a college player versus a high school uh, guy in Allen, and, and how different is the leverage with your subsequent draft picks, given that, that those guys still have eligibility, unlike some of the senior guys you drafted uh, fourth through 10th round last year? Hey, Tim. Yeah. We, we're not looking at these, these players or, or these selections as being a leverage or a leverage game, so to speak. We're, we're looking at how do we value the talent? How does the player view himself? And can we line up on, on that mutual, mutual compromise, I guess, so to speak, or mutual interest? So that's the way we're looking at it. Not as much as a lever game, but much more of a value and a, uh, and a, shared mindset of what the players what the players worth uh, in terms of the the way in which eligibility goes you know i think all of our players in this in this unique environment have the ability to go back to school from the college side and have the ability you know to go to college on the front end but you know our hope is that the communication that we had with the players the the recognition that we have for their talent will ultimately line up and we'll be able to get to get to the finish line thanks thanks Tom. Hey guys, uh, Mike Fitzpatrick from AP. Um, I guess this is uh, really for any of you, but maybe mostly for for Tommy and Mark. Um, this was obviously a totally unprecedented situation of a draft, uh, both in the, the prep leading up to it and the shortness of it. Just you know, just five rounds, six picks for you guys. Just overall, I mean, how did it? How did you guys feel like it play out? Like it played out? Um, were there surprises? Did it go? you know, sort of the way you expected or totally different or just what was your, your feeling on it overall? Well, it's, it's the preparation was <laughs> certainly, uh, uh, certainly a lot more difficult uh, than it had been in the past. It's actually better to go see the player then get on the phone and talk to Tram or call Brody and tell, you, t t tell them what you saw. Uh, instead, we're sitting on our couches doing Zoom calls for uh, a couple of months. So, uh, we just had to recalibrate how we were going to do this. Um, we, we did get almost a third of the season in, so we did have a lot of live looks um, at these players. Uh, the, the biggest difference, you usually go back and see a player two or three times. We weren't afforded that this year. Uh, so instead, we had to turn our energy into uh, looking at a ton of video every day, then having a Zoom call and discuss it. Uh, I think the first round of the draft worked out uh, – uh, about the same as our predictions on who would go where. Obviously, we felt fortunate um, with Pete Crow Armstrong uh, getting to us. It, it was certainly a, a, a player we didn't feel would get to us. Uh, so so that, was, that was a huge benefit. But uh, overall, I, I, I probably have to take a look later in, in, in the later rounds, the fourth and fifth rounds, and see probably a little more diversity to it. But right now, I couldn't say. Yeah, and, and this year with the inability to see an entire spring, and, and Tommy and I always say this to our staff, we, we feel so good about the preparation and attention to detail that our staff has. This, this never is a four- or five-month draft, meaning, you know, when the season starts in February till June, this is a 12-month draft. And because our guys do their homework so well, because we're so thorough in the summer prior, in the fall prior, in the winter, before the draft, we felt really good about all the players that we took because we had done our homework. Just for one example, uh, the area scout for JT Ginn lives in Jackson, Mississippi, where JT is from. He went to Mississippi State. So that's Jet Butler. Jet was a former minor leaguer in the Mets system. So he had known JT for a long time and really was thorough on the background and the makeup. And, and P. Crow Armstrong, we had seen since he was 15, 16 years old. So the preparation of this staff is one, we, one reason why we've had successful drafts. Hey, guys, this is for um, Tommy and Mark. What uh, specifically intrigued you guys about Isaiah Green? 
I tell you what, there's, there was a lot. You, you don't have to uh, see him play too much to, to not be impressed with both his hit tool and his secondary tools. Um, really, really impressive kid uh, as, as far as playing center field. Uh, you know, obviously, if you look at our draft, we stayed up the middle quite a bit with two center fielders, a shortstop, and a catcher. Um, but uh, this such an ease to Isaiah's game. Uh, on top of not just a defensive player, but when he's in the batter's box. We talk about being an athlete, but we also talk about being an athlete in the box, in the batter's box, and, and he's it. It's barrel feel, barrel contact. Uh, he's got strength. He, you know, I give Brody a lot of credit here. Um, even though he's my boss, I'm not blowing smoke here. Uh, to get these deals done the last two years um, is a weapon. That's all it is. It's an absolute weapon. Uh, to be able to line up the best players is one thing. And I think as a staff, we're really good at that. To go and sign them, that's a totally different thing. Um, and we've been able to do that. So uh, Isaiah is a perfect example of that. And he, he does not belong where we took him. Yeah, I mean, Tommy and I have worked together a long time. We love up the middle players. We like athletes. And when you have a chance to get an athletic player in center field that has an element to every tool, all of the five tools, which he does. And this, this young man oozes athleticism, oozes projection. He's a great kid. I got a chance to meet him when I saw him. Those are the types of players that you can do that projection on and feel comfortable with it. Um, so we, we're very happy. I thought that was a, a great value pick. Great job by our staff on the West Coast, Drew Toussaint, our West Coast cross checker, and, and uh, Glenn Walker, our area scout, did a tremendous job with him. Thank you. How much of an advantage do you think you guys and the other large market teams have now with the bypass players that you can pick up for 20000 in that you can say, here, sign with an attractive team like us, unlike most years where you just have 35 guys from round 6 to 40. And with the 20000 cap, how do you think you'll do balancing and convincing them to sign for you rather than either stay for a senior year or attend college or JUCO? Hey, Ron, it's a good question. The, the short answer is we don't know how this is all going to play out. This is a new unchartered territory for, for any of us, you know, whether it's on the team side or even the player, player community. We just don't know how this is all going to unfold. You know, players are going to have to make decisions now based less on financial opportunities and more player development opportunities, uh, cultural fit, and, and a relationship fit. So those are the, the things that we're going to try to focus, focus on is help players understand who the New York Mets are, what, uh, what it means to, to develop within a, a culture of a mindset, that is, is the fabric of who we are and what Jared Banner and Allard Baird are creating and, and then help them understand that to play in New York is, is the biggest and best place in the world to play. And if they've got the confidence and we will know, be able to identify their talent to succeed here. And if we can, if we can give them a platform to be what they want to be and who they want to be, then I hope that we'll be, be an attractive target or attractive destination. Do you put extra emphasis maybe on Long Island and the corridor from South Jersey through upstate New York and Connecticut, knowing that there might be kids who grew up Mets fans who would normally have to go where they're drafted, but here have a choice? Well, geography, I'm sure, plays, plays a factor in, in players' decision-making, or it may play a factor in decision-making. But you know, we hope to be able to have a broad canvas. Tommy and Tram talked about the work and the 12-month process that our scouts put into it. So we're going to keep an open mind and do what we continue, we've been doing, which is try to try to acquire the best talent we can in the organization. And if that's if that's in our backyard, that that's an incredible incredible gift because people people here or where you guys are, I'm not in New York right now, but the people people who have grown up in the in the New York tri-state area have have an understanding of what it means to be in in a New York Mets uniform and the tradition that we have and the, the new new era that we find ourselves in right now. But the, from a scouting standpoint, Ron, we're, we're focused on trying to, to paint as broad of a brush as we can to get the best players we can. Thank you. I just had a quick, I just had a quick one um, on your fifth round pick, or it seems like he's got a, a hell of a backstory. Uh, I'm curious, 
what your gauges of just of this kid's makeup and, and what kind of human being he is on top of obviously the baseball obstacles he's overcome. Sure. Well, he cancer survivor. Um, I mean, this, this is a kid that will not quit. Uh, he, he really won't. Uh, our scouts fell in love with a split finger to tell you the truth. I mean, he throws a heavy, heavy fastball, uh, and he uses that split as his, his out pitch, his strikeout pitch. He, he accumulated tremendous numbers this year. Um, and we felt it was a great value there to get that kind of arm uh, with that kind of out pitch there was a great way to end, to end the draft. So, uh, you know, obviously this is a high makeup kid, high quality kid who happens to have a really gifted pitch. I'll add on just just to that too, Tony, is that, you know, we took two players here that, that have gone, gone through and are going through significant adversity in, in JT and, and in Eric. You know, what, what we've done here is uh, looked at talent, but also you know, seen what kind of purpose kids have when they do face adversity. And I think this, this is a perfect example that to go through what, what he went through a couple of years ago when it would have been easy to stop, stop playing baseball or lose his purpose. And he never did. And so he's, he's motivated and he has, uh, he wants, wants the challenge of professional baseball and we're glad to be able to give him that opportunity. Thank you. Hey guys. Um, I, I know bro, you mentioned you really, and, and nobody has a, a good feel for what this is going to look like from here on out, all the undrafted guys. Um, I just, you know, do you expect sort of a, a free-for-all starting on Sunday? And, and do you guys in particular, um, I know you don't know what the whole industry is going to look like, but do you still have a lot of players that you're very much interested in that you, that you want to target um, and, and uh, you know, that you want to make a strong push for? We've, we've been – we've done a lot of work, as these two guys have said. We've done a, work, a lot of work on a lot of players and only six – six rounds of players or five rounds of players, six picks for us were able to be selected. But I hope it's not a free for all. I hope, I know it's not going to be a free for all for us. And I hope it's not a free for all for the players. We'd like the players to be thoughtful. We'd like them to consider you know, everything that we have to offer and for us to be able to prioritize the players in which we, in which we extend offers to and, and ultimately bring on board. So I think we'll, we'll continue to, to again look for the best talent, but I would say we're we're more focused on a thoughtful process where players can make decisions based on based on the right right characteristics that, that we have to offer. Thanks, Brody. Are you going to have uh, the draft picks uh, go to the fall league this fall, or what are you going to have to do after you have them signed? Yeah, we don't know. I mean, I think we all still have to continue to focus on where the health and safety is in the country and keep keep an eye on that to make sure that anywhere we have the opportunity to send our players that they're going to be able to do it in a safe environment but at this point we we want to try to get them signed and then put a player development pr program together for them jared banner has already contacted and been in touch with most if not all the, the six players that we selected and those programs will will start you know remotely here until we can all get back into business as usual and then we'll uh, we'll build into on-site activity as soon as we realistically can. And the last thing, in the short term, it sounds like you guys are leaning for spring training two to St. Lucie instead of uh, City Field. What goes, what do you weigh in the decision? Well, you know, again, we'll, we'll have to take it day by day as we see what, what presents itself. But, you know, the, the complex that, that we have here in, in Florida, Clover Park, is, is most of you saw during spring training is a first state of the art, first rate state of the art facility. And we've got multiple fields. We've got, you know, a clubhouse and a weight room and a training room that we feel like we'll be able to protect the players' health and safety um, if we do get back up and up and running. But, you know, we'll, uh, we'll make the final decision, you know, as we, as we get a clear roadmap. But I do think we have the luxury of a great, great stadium and ballpark at, at City Field and then a, uh, a fantastic facility for, for developing players on multiple multiple fields with with brand new facilities that, that should serve as well thank you thank you uh especially to brody tommy and mark um this concludes tonight's uh mets draft conference call thanks everybody get some rest thank you, thank you.